Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the AGM and associated program. There is a theme today. It is the state of nature. And we hope that gradually as the day evolves, you will see what that means. Tony Juniper is a writer, a wildlife campaigner, and a sustainability expert. He was a director of Friends of the Earth, and he has many responsibilities and advisory roles. I'm quite amazed that he's got the time to come and visit us. His latest book is this one, What Has Nature Ever Done for Us? There are copies of it which you can buy at lunchtime. And for me, this book was a very instructive and easy read. It was highly worrying, and yet it was strangely positive. And I think that's what you will get when you actually hear Tony Juniper himself. Tony. Well, th thanks very much indeed, John, for that very kind introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, first reason is because I love the Wildlife Trust. I've been involved with the work that you've been doing for pretty much 30 years in different ways, and I, I'm always amazed by how much you manage to get done, and it's great to see the movement in such good heart and doing such fantastic work and, and still growing. And the other reason I'm so pleased to be here, because as a child, when I got my inspiration to work on the conservation side, one of the things that was very powerful for me was family visits to the Isle of Wight and just being struck by these incredible clouds of butterflies and these marvellous chalk downlands covered in flowers, and that's one of the things that really drove me into the career that I've pursued um, over, over the last several decades, and as I say, very much in parallel with the work of the wildlife trusts. Over that 30-odd years that I've been involved, it, it's quite incredible to see how much progress we've actually made in the sense of pollution prevention laws. We've got better protection for wildlife habitats in this country. We've had some of the worst pesticides phased out. We've begun to make some inroads towards a cleaner energy system, and even on the global stage, we've seen a bit of progress in, for example, the phase-out of chemicals causing the depletion of the ozone layer. But set against all of that, of course, and the State of Nature report is a very timely reminder, is we're still going in the wrong direction. Despite the positive progress, we're still seeing declines of habitats, species, and, of course, we're still seeing the rise of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So all of this... I think tells us that something is still not quite right. Despite the fact that we've got the attention of the public increasingly, people understand the scale of this. But the reason we're not going uh, towards meeting our conservation targets, I think, has got not much to do with conservation and actually quite a lot to do with the economy. Because we've fallen into the trap of still seeing nature as the enemy of economic growth and something that has to be sacrificed in order to achieve progress. You hear this the whole time. And since the recession that began in 2008, that level of uh, political framing, if you will, has increased. And we now see this being used the whole time by the Treasury, uh, by the Prime Minister, by even the Environment Minister, who should be a champion for these causes, telling us that, in fact, nature has to be deregulated. We have to move back on our environmental ambitions because we need economic growth, which is much more important. Now, the reason I wrote What Has Nature Ever Done For Us, which John was kind enough to, to mention is because over the last few years, I've been in the very fortunate position of being able to see a lot of information and data and reports which show that that view, that the environment has to be sacrificed for the economy, it's completely wrong. Not only is it wrong, the opposite is in fact the case, because without nature, there is no economy. And so what I've tried to do in this book is to pull together all the information to show that there's a very strong scientific case for protecting nature in order to look after the economy. That's a very different view to the one that you hear so frequently from chief executives and from politicians, but one which is increasingly the case in terms of what we know from the science. And I think as conservationists, we need to be very confident about making this point and to show everybody that actually 
the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of ecology, not the other way around. And in telling the story of why this is the case, I start from the world beneath our feet, and I relate a story um, close to where I live, um, in Cambridgeshire, where there is um, a piece of fenland called Holm Fen. Now, had you gone to Holm Fen in the 1850s, you would have seen a very different landscape to the one that you see today. And the reason it's very different is because of drainage. That area of North Cambridgeshire was once several hundred square kilometres of peat uh, that had built up since the end of the Ice Age, when the sea levels rose as the ice melted, the Fenden rivers backed up, and this great area of waterlogged land uh, began to accumulate this massive body of peatlands. By the time of the Victorian uh, era, this area was becoming um, drained in order to make way for agriculture. And at the same time as there was uh, a, a, a shrinking of the land, there was also um, a, a rather more profound change taking place. Because as areas like Whittlesea Mere, which was a large inland lake, was drained, not only did you have the land shrinking, you had it exposed to the oxygen. And this vast body of peat, which is basically a body of carbon, began to unite with the oxygen, and the land literally evaporated. Now, in 1852, there was a man called William Wells who understood that the drainage operations up there would be causing some profound changes to the natural habitats. And he imported from London a piece of the Crystal Palace that was being dismantled. And he pushed this great big piece of iron through the peat into the marine clay beneath. And he fixed it so that the top of the post was at ground level. If you go up there today, the top of that post is four meters above the ground. And over several hundred square kilometers, the land has literally turned into thin air. Because by taking away the water, you've exposed the carbon in those unrotted plant remains to oxygen. They've turned into carbon dioxide. Now, the reason I mention this is because you may have noticed that over recent uh, months, there's been a lot of headlines around what the climate change science is telling us. And the need to stabilize CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, which is a very urgent priority for humankind, and, of course, we're quite correctly spending vast amounts of, of money and changing the law in order to encourage cleaner vehicles, energy efficiency, renewable energy, even making big steps towards nuclear power again. All of these things are huge decisions that we have to make across the world. But as we're making these decisions, it seems to me that a big bit of what nature is doing is being completely ignored. There's research out there telling us that if we looked after the world's soils better to reduce the carbon leakage from agricultural soils, from pastures, and indeed from peatlands, never, mention, never to mention forests, we could do a big bit of this job of reducing CO2 in the atmosphere. In other words, nature could do the job for us. And I think that's something that we need to be um, reflecting in how we take forward the conservation agenda in the years ahead. And some of the numbers linked to this are really quite staggering. There's one estimate that came from the British government a couple of years ago that estimates that if we reduced the rate of deforestation in the tropics between 2009 and 2030, the carbon value of that, if you had to do this through renewable energy or through nuclear power, would be about $3.7 trillion worth of value. These are the kinds of numbers that are being generated. And yet we're told the drainage of peatlands and the destruction of forests is necessary for economic development. Nothing could be further from the truth. And of course, those soils, peatlands, agricultural soils and others that are holding such vast quantities of carbon, those soils are doing other very, very important jobs for us too that we take utterly for granted. One, of course, is the endless job of nutrient recycling. If you took a, a tablespoonful of healthy agricultural soil from around here or near to where I live in eastern England, you took that soil into the laboratory, take it to the electron microscope and start counting the microorganisms in that tablespoonful of soil... If you've got the patience and the time, you will get to something like 6 billion individual microorganisms in that soil sample in the order of 20,000 species. That would be a typical finding you'd get from this part of the world. And these organisms aren't just sitting there passively. There's all sorts of very intricate interactions going on, very complex ecology between predator and prey, between parasite and host. All of these organisms living on the organic material that's these carbon-based molecules from old plants that are being broken down and nutrients released in the process, thereby fueling new plant growth. But at the same time as these microorganisms are undertaking this job of recycling nutrients, they're also interacting with each other in these really quite complex and dynamic relationships. And one of the ways in which they survive in this complex and competitive world 
is through the invention of various chemical weapons. And some of the bacteria in the soil have invented chemical weapons that have proved extremely useful to us, uh, not least in the form of nearly all of our clinically useful antibiotics came from those soil microorganisms that are interacting beneath the ground in this battle for survival, using these chemicals to fight off other microorganisms. And, of course, we're now using them in medicine, in hospitals, and on farms to fight off bacteria. And as we go into this world of antibiotic resistance, which many scientists are now becoming more alarmed about, where do you think we might find replacements for our modern antibiotics? The first place everyone will look is in those very same soils that across the world are being degraded, eroded, and plundered for short-term food production without much consideration for their long-term value in terms of the protection of the climate and the innovations that we can get from these microorganisms, never mind the uh, endless recycling of nutrients. These things that are being done seemingly for nothing, of course, need to be maintained. And if you look at that vast store of biological knowledge under the ground and you think of the potential for that in terms of the uh, benefits we might find for treating various medical challenges into the future, not just antibiotic resistance, but also potential cures for cancer. And then you look above the ground in terms of the diversity that's being supported by those soils and at the plants and animals living on top, and there's about 8.5 million of them, we think, then you see this incredible library of solutions that we're only just becoming aware of in terms of what we might take from these. On the medical side, it's not only the antibiotics, various other innovations we've taken from wild animals and plants uh, are now valuable to the point of being about 50% of the global pharmaceutical industry. In the United States, that's worth $650 billion per year. About half of that is coming from innovations first found in animals and plants. It goes without saying, all of our food is, of course, coming from once wild animals and plants. And on top of that, we're finding this incredible body of potential now from looking at nature to inspire solutions in the world of design, engineering, and indeed for more sustainable energy. And I looked at some of the examples of this that have been emerging in recent years, and you'd be utterly surprised to see the diversity of solutions that's now coming from looking at nature as the way in which we might meet modern challenges. One uh, good example, I thought, was the Chrysler Motor Corporation that has just invented a new car body design. It's based upon a design originally conceived by the boxfish. Now, the boxfish lives on reefs where it's predated by other fish. It's developed this incredibly rigid external skeleton which it uses to fight off predators. By copying the boxfish, Chrysler have managed to make a much stronger car body design using much less steel. Double benefit. Better for the driver in terms of accident protection. Better for the planet in terms of less emissions and less resources being needed to make it. I came across research looking at the uh, design solutions invented by certain kinds of termites in maintaining a stable temperature inside their mounds um, during the course of a 24-hour uh, fluctuation in temperature that might go to 28 degrees during the day and down to a few degrees at night. The termites are keeping their temperature inside the mound at 16 to 17 degrees all the time. They don't have a wind turbine. They don't have air conditioning. They don't have a nuclear power station. They've done it purely by designing their tunnels and their, their mounds to circulate the air in a certain way to keep the temperature at a very constant level. Architects are now looking at that kind of technology to be building super-efficient buildings for the future, cutting drastically the carbon emissions that come from the built environment, should we be able to understand how these animals do this. There was an example I came across in, in South Australia uh, during the course of writing this book. Um, a lady researcher I, I met in Kangaroo Island, which is right down in the south of uh, of Australia near to uh, the Southern Ocean. It's very cold down there in winter, but there's a species of snake that manages to remain active all year long. And this particular snake has, has found the trick of being able to absorb very weak sunshine to lift its body temperature up to the point where it can hunt, even in quite cold conditions. She's trying to understand how that snake does that in order that we might be able one day to invent solar heater collectors that we could be using at very high latitudes in the world to be able to replace fossil fuels. The snake's already invented a way of, of doing this. So these kinds of examples, you kind of begin to build a picture of, of how these different components of nature are adding really big value to the economy, even though we can't really see it. And actually, we don't often see it until it's gone. And one example in terms of this um, potential for eco-innovation, the idea that we can get good design solutions from animals and plants, one example of what this means should you lead uh, something to disappear 
uh, is seen in the example of the gastric brooding frogs. Now, these two animals, there were two species of gastric brooding frog. They had mastered the technique of hosting their tadpoles inside the adult frog's stomach. And some physiologists looked at this and thought, well, that's quite interesting because by rights, those tadpoles should be digested by the frog's gastric juices. They weren't. And they thought, well, probably some kind of chemical solution has been invented to prevent that. We should look at it because we might find a cure there for peptic ulcers in humans. And indeed, they did go and have a look, but they couldn't find out because these two frogs had gone extinct as a result of the destruction of their habitat. So examples like this, I think, tell us a great deal about the folly that we embark on in not seeing nature as having these kinds of potential values, even if we can't register and measure them right now. And then once you start to look at this, you realize there's a whole other layer of uh, value coming from nature beyond the bits we can copy for medicine or for engineering, beyond the bits we can measure the carbon value of or the bits we can see the, the food production value in terms of market prices for potatoes and everything else. There's a whole other layer on top of this, which is about the relationships between different bits of the natural world and how that sustains different bits of our economic welfare. And I, I suppose uh, the, the one that's been most prevalent in the last couple of years has been the relationship between flowering plants and the animal pollinators that enable them to complete their life cycle. And uh, perhaps the most obvious uh, bit of this relationship in terms of human welfare is the relationship between crop plants and bees. And if you look across the world and the, the diversity of plants that humans need in order to be able to survive and ensure food security, about two-thirds of the crop plant species in the world rely on pollination, um, mostly from insects and mostly from bees. And, of course, the decline of pollinators worldwide is therefore something of a cause for concern, especially when you recognize that the pollinated plants in the world in terms of sales into markets of agricultural produce is worth about $1 trillion per year. That's being underpinned by these little insects that everybody tends to think will always be doing this work and will always be there. And if you look at the cost of replacing the kinds of services being done by these animals, you start getting some pretty big numbers. One that I think is, is amongst the most thorough came from a process called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, published in 2010. That process tells us that the value of bees, estimated value of bees and insect pollinators worldwide, is about $190 billion per year. And you think, okay, that sounds like a really big number, these little bees doing whatever they do. A bit abstract, as well as being a bit big, until you start to look at some of those cases where you realize that people are having to start doing the work being done by the pollinators because the pollinators have disappeared. And there's one uh, part of southwestern China where you can see this uh, already, where in the 1980s there was very heavy pesticide use advocated in order to be able to boost fruit yields in apple, pear, and, and cherry orchards. And this was a very successful strategy in killing the pests that were damaging the fruit, uh, but also very successful in killing all the pollinators as well. And so if you go to that part of southwestern China today in the springtime, you will see entire villages out in the orchards with feather dusters and people on ladders climbing the trees, moving the pollen between the blossoms by hand because the bees that were once doing this work have gone. That's when you can start to see the practical implications of these kinds of numbers that are coming with the value that we're as yet largely unable to see in mainstream economics coming from pollinators. And food is a pretty fundamental uh, part of our well-being. And I think for, for that reason, we should be taking some of these um, projections as to the likely uh, decline, continuing decline of pollinators into the future very seriously indeed. And of course, all the things that we know about as conservationists that are good for pollinators obviously has been the bread and butter of our work for years. Meadows, rough edges to fields, woodlands, pastures, wetlands and everything else. These are where pollinators live. That's an important bit of the infrastructure that keeps the economy going. And I think if we start looking at it like that, we start to see some rather different um, priorities for government. Similarly with public health, another fundamental part of our welfare that is sustained, at least in different parts of the world, by relationships that have emerged between different bits of, of natural systems. One story that I relate in the book, which I thought was very powerful in uh, being able to explore this connection a little bit, relates to the loss of India's vultures. Now, these birds used to be pretty common. I visited India in 1993, and there were vultures everywhere, um, in the cities, in the countryside. Within a few years, they had nearly gone, and between 1993 and 2003, 
these animals basically became functionally extinct. Three species of vulture in the early 1990s, total population of about 40 million birds. By 2000s, the early 2000s, they'd gone. They're not quite extinct. A few tens of thousands remain in remote areas. But the reason these birds went down so catastrophically to be functionally extinct in most of the countryside was because of the consequences of a drug called diclofenac used in veterinary medicine. Now, this drug is very effective in getting cows back on their feet and buffalo in rural areas where poor farmers need these animals for work and for, um, for milk. But the uh, effect of this drug, should these animals be injected within a week of their death and then the carcass is left in the countryside, there would be a residue that would be taken up by the vultures and this caused the vultures to suffer organ failure and they died pretty quickly. So you can imagine a dead buffalo in a rural area would attract a couple of hundred vultures from the local district the entire population would be wiped out in one go. And this happened right across India. And so these birds were gone. Now, lots of things um, that, that you, you can link to vultures. And, of course, one is their scavenging habitats and, uh, habits rather, and the fact that they clear up the carcasses of these um, dead animals in the countryside. And if you looked at the combined work of 40 million vultures, the researchers who looked at the consequences of these birds disappearing estimated they were taking something like 12 million tonnes of meat between them a year from dead animals by the side of the road and in the countryside. If you take away the means to clear up 12 million tonnes of rotting carrion, you leave that food available for something else. In this case, it was India's wild dog population, which was the principal beneficiary of the vultures going the wild dog population rocketed by about 7 million animals over a very short time. 7 million more dogs led to many millions more dog bites in the countryside, leading to an estimated 50,000 deaths from rabies that wouldn't have occurred had the vultures still been there, leading to a bill for the Indian economy alongside other impacts that came with this in the order of $34 billion. This was the cost of the loss of the vultures. And you can only see that cost after the event. You know, there were maybe some... Um, modest in, uh, economic gains to be achieved through releasing diclofenac as a drug to be used in widespread uh, veterinary medicine across the countryside, but nobody had calculated what could be the impact of this in terms of the downside. Absolutely huge. Another story that relates to public health I came across um, in the aftermath of an outbreak of West Nile virus in the United States in 2001. This killed a lot of people, made a lot of people extremely ill, cost the U.S. economy a couple of hundred million dollars. One interesting thing, however, in the aftermath of this particular disease outbreak was how it was very unevenly spread across the United States. Some areas had pretty high levels of infection, other areas had very low levels of infection, and some researchers tried to get into understanding why this was the case. Why is this neighborhood affected when this one isn't? They look pretty similar. Socioeconomic uh, data, lifestyle, the kinds of life experiences these people have had, you should see pretty similar levels of infection. And the thing that they discovered, which explained this difference in infection rates in different areas most clearly in terms of the statistical data, was local wild bird diversity. Where there were more local species of birds, where people lived, there were less infections. And this turned out to be explainable through the fact that the vector of West Nile virus is a mosquito, which is an avian specialist. It's a mosquito that prefers to bite birds first. Take away the birds, and this mosquito will go somewhere else to feed, namely to people. So the birds were diluting the infections. They were creating a buffer against the disease being spread amongst the human population. And so for public health, in that case, and in being able to limit the spread of that particular disease, you can see a public policy there which would say, well, what we should be doing is maintaining big trees in parks, we should be maintaining areas along watercourses where there's rough vegetation and semi-natural areas for birds to be living because that's going to be able to create this kind of buffer. I'm not sure that's actually happened yet in terms of how public health in the future might be planned for the United States in being able to control these kinds of things. But undoubtedly, something there for us to be reflecting on in terms of how we look at some of these joined-up solutions that we might be developing for the future. Similarly, when it comes to pest control, uh, another thing that we've become used to treating with chemicals rather than seeing nature as an ally. And there's a whole literature out there now which I found really fascinating in the sense of beginning to quantify some of the values we're getting from the relationships between predator and prey in the natural world. And I, I think probably the, 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 the most illustrative study I came across was from a couple of Dutch researchers looking at the effects of great tits in shaping the size of the apple harvest in some orchards in the Netherlands. 
And what they did to find out what kind of effect the birds were having is that they experimentally excluded great tits from one area of woodland by putting mist nets over the trees, uh, from one area of orchard by putting mist nets on the trees, and in the other area of orchard encouraged the birds in by putting nest boxes up. To cut a long story short, what they found is that when these birds were present in the spring and early summer feeding chicks, the level of caterpillar predation was so dramatic that it led to a 50% increase in the apple harvest at the other end of the season. So the damage that's being done by caterpillars in the springtime is visible in the harvest in the autumn and late summer. And one big difference between the uh, outcomes was found to be down to the level of predation of caterpillars going on by insectivorous birds. And again, it's another one of those hidden values. You can see the cost of the pesticides being sold into the market and the apparent uh, value that's being generated for GDP and everything else by these kinds of uh, manufacturing of these kinds of chemicals. Nobody is really as yet able to see the value of these insectivorous birds going about their business. And I think perhaps some really quite profound uh, learnings we can take from some of this information about the potential for integrated crop management going into the future to be able to save resources, to be able to conserve biodiversity at the same time as protecting yields. And um, various other studies out there, one looking at the um, effect of a bird called evening grosbeak in North American forestry plantations where we get a lot of the world's timber and pulp for paper making. They found the value of these birds in terms of protecting the timber harvest to be worth about $1,500 per hectare per year. These birds are eating lots of caterpillars that otherwise would be damaging the pine foliage and slowing down the tree growth. Farmers looking at the role of insectivorous birds in coffee plantations in Jamaica found them to be worth something like $300 per hectare per year through taking uh, the um, pests off of the coffee, thereby protecting yields. So this is all pretty well-trodden territory, I think, increasingly from ecological scientists and working with um, ecological economists, beginning to paint this very different picture from the one that you would have uh, us all believe if you listen to the way in which economics is done in terms of mainstream policymaking. And the same thing can be said for water, another one of those fundamental aspects of human well-being, right up there with health and food security. And one of those things that we take utterly for granted, you've got jugs of water on the table there, where did that come from? Well, out of the tap, yes. Uh, but there's a whole big story before this got anywhere near a reservoir or indeed even a river. And if you start looking at the global water cycle, you see some really quite miraculous processes at work. And actually, when I started to look at this and started to trace back the, the replenishment and sources of fresh water, I began to um, really uh, be surprised by some of the things I was seeing. Because if you think about this, where does it come from? Not point. 0.3% of the world's water is in that liquid, fresh state that's on your table there. Nearly all of it is salt water, and of the 2.5% that isn't salt water, nearly all of that is in ice or deep in groundwater. There's a vanishingly thin little sliver of the total, which is going around in terms of this uh, freshwater cycle uh, that enables life on land to continue in the form of fresh water being transported by clouds coming off of the oceans ultimately, and this is the, the real source of this. It's being replenished by the sun hitting the surface of the seas, creating water vapor, and that water vapor goes up into the sky and obviously trans, transports around the planet on the winds to be um, falling as rain. Now, one of the things which is really interesting about this is the extent to which the clouds that form from the water vapor require nuclei, around which to coalesce the tiny water droplets. And there's lots of little nuclei being boosted into the atmosphere every day. Some of it's coming from dust being kicked up over the deserts. Some of it is coming from salt spray bouncing off of the cliffs um, around the world where the seas meet the land and also coming off the top of the waves. But if you look at these kinds of sources of nuclei, and if you're an atmospheric physicist, you realize that actually there's not enough of that to explain how much cloud is being produced on the Earth every day. And you need to look somewhere else. And the place where people have looked and they think this is the place where these nuclei are being generated is by a group of plankton drifting in the top of the ocean called the coccolithophores. Now, these organisms produce a substance called dimethyl sulfide as part of their normal metabolism. And if you go to the seaside and sniff in the smell of sea air, that's what you can smell. It's this substance being produced by the plankton. It gets into the atmosphere in vast quantities and it unites with oxygen to form little tiny sulfate particles 
and that apparently is one of the ways in which so much cloud is being generated. And the cloud, of course, is the reason why we managed to top up our water jugs day in, day out, year in, year out, because this water, of course, is going to finish up in a sewer one way or the other, probably later on today, and it's going to go back down through a series of treatments and hopefully finish up going quite cleanly back into the ocean, where it will be once more restored through evaporation, but also being backed up by the plankton. And the reason I, I, I mention the plankton, you may think, well, you know, the plankton, surely there's nothing we can do to the plankton to um, be able to interrupt that particular set of relationships. But unfortunately, uh, one of the downsides of the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere is not only the climate change, but also the progressive acidification of the ocean. And some of these organisms, the coccolithophores amongst them, are susceptible to this because they form calcite shells. These things are minuscule. You need an electron microscope to see them properly. But they form a calcite shell, which it looks like might be interrupted through the progressive acidification of the seas, being driven ahead through the combustion of fossil fuels and deforestation. So this is something we do need to keep an eye on. And it's something we need to keep an eye on also from the point of view of these organisms being at the base of food chains, which, of course, are also contributing to human welfare in quite a lot of other different ways. And the most obvious manifestation of this is the oceanic fish we eat, we take about 90 million tons of fish out of the sea worldwide every year. All of it is being sustained by those very same plankton because these are the organisms that are converting sunlight into chemical energy, same as the plants on land enabling us to live. It's the plankton in the ocean that are supporting the food webs that lead ultimately to the cod, tuna, swordfish, and all the rest of it, which is so important for human welfare across the world, supporting hundreds of millions of jobs, and in the case of the fishing industry, supplying something like $278 billion worth of GDP globally, would you believe, in terms of the catch and processing of the fish, the retailing, the boat maintenance, and everything else. A huge industry being supported by this very same plankton. And if that wasn't enough, in terms of the oxygen we're breathing uh, as well being on the list. Because if you take a sniff of air in this room today, at least 50% of the air you're breathing in terms of the oxygen was put back there by those very same plankton. And if you look at another job they're doing, you realize that the value of these things is even bigger in the sense of them taking up about one-third of the CO2 we're putting out every year. These organisms are taking the CO2, they're incorporating it into their shells, and when they die, they're taking it down to the deep seabed. That's how the world's chalk was formed. Chalk hills right out here from the Cretaceous. It's exactly the same process that continues today on the modern Earth, which is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it deep into the oceans out of the way of uh, climatic impacts. And so you start looking at this in terms of the process of enabling rainfall to develop, the replenishment of oxygen, the soaking up of carbon dioxide, and the powering of the food webs that lead to the fish, you realize actually that's a pretty important set of economic services that are going on there. And yet hardly anyone talks about this. You know, we hear um, various people saying, well, you know, we've got an economic uh, cost that we have to bear in mind as we go towards a low-carbon economy. Nobody's talking about the impacts on the ocean from this, which actually is powering the entire planet. One estimate as to the value of those services coming from the ocean in terms of these plankton-driven uh, dynamics is in the order of $21 trillion per year. Makes even the U.S. national debt look pretty small. And on top of what's going on in these processes out in the open ocean, around the edge of the ocean, we're getting immense value as well from different bits of natural systems. And um, across the globe, if you look at some of the most productive carbon pumps we have, which are removing CO2 from the atmosphere, they are seen in the form of mangrove forests, coral reefs, salt marshes, and indeed seagrass beds, of which we have some fine examples down here on the south coast of England. These things are sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, storing it in different bits of the system, and doing a very important job alongside those terrestrial ecosystems like forests and peat bogs. They're also doing another very important job in defending many of the world's coasts from extreme conditions. And bear in mind that we now know that we are in for a level of climate change, whether we like it or not, irrespective of whether we cut emissions very quickly. We're going to get some level of warming. We already have some. We're going to get some more. One of the effects of this will be to provoke more extreme events in the form of extreme rainfall, and also large storms coming in from the ocean hitting coastal areas. And there's a very rich literature out there already telling us about the value that we're getting from nature in being able to protect different bits of, of human infrastructure and property from the effects of these extreme conditions by being able to take the power 
out of some of these kinds of events. And one very um, illustrative piece of work I came across was one that looked at the difference between two massive hurricanes that went through the Gulf of Mexico uh, in 2005. Two big storms. One of them you would have heard of, Hurricane Katrina. There was another one about three weeks later, which made landfall about 400 kilometers to the west of there in Texas called Hurricane Rita. One storm you would have seen led to utter chaos in the world's most powerful and biggest economy. A couple of thousand people died, about $80 billion worth of insured losses. city of New Orleans pretty much wrecked. Hurricane Rita, very similar-sized storm, didn't make many headlines because only seven people died and property damage was minimal. The principal difference between these two storms was the state of the coastal wetlands where they made landfall. Hurricane Katrina came across degraded wetlands where ship canals had been cut deep in land. This had led to salt water penetrating into the freshwater swamp forests on the landward side of the salt marshes. This effectively removed this massive bioshield of natural habitats that would have removed the power of the storm surge, this great body of water coming in front of the hurricane, it would have removed it before it had hit the city levees had the wildlife habitats still been intact. Where Hurricane Rita came ashore, 16 kilometers of uninterrupted healthy wetlands lay between the shore and where human habitation was, and the power of the storm was massively diminished. And you see a, a very similar pattern emerging in the aftermath of the tsunami which came across the Indian Ocean in the uh, wake of that terrible earthquake in Boxing Day 2004, with the tsunami wave wiping out communities much more disastrously and dramatically in those places where the coastal mangroves and coral reefs had been removed. And if you start to scale up these kinds of values and look at particular countries and work out what kind of economic contribution is being made by these kinds of coastal systems, then a lovely piece of work was done by WWF and the World Resources Institute looking at Belize and trying to quantify the value of that country's mangroves and coral reef. And its coral reef is the second biggest barrier reef in the world. And of course, these kinds of ecosystems across the world have been plundered. They've been cleared to make way for port facilities, for hotels, and shrimp farming has been a big, uh, a big pressure on uh, mangrove forests in, in recent years in particular. And obviously the economic value of all of this is very easy to see. If you're a hotel developer, you can bring people in, you can make money. If you're building a port, you can make big cash by opening up new infrastructure. The shrimp farming industry is very, very lucrative, which is why across the, the tropical countries you've seen these ecosystems being degraded very rapidly. But this piece of work, looking at Belize, discovered that the value of the intact systems was much, much bigger than when they were converted into these other uses. And there were three big reasons why these ecosystems for Belize were so important. One was the um, replenishment of oceanic fisheries, because the, the, the oceanic adult fish, they come into the mangroves and into the coral areas to breed. It's a nursery, then the fish go back out to the ocean where they're caught. Obviously a big attractor for tourism. People come there to go bird watching and to go diving over the reef. But the big thing, the huge big thing, that would cost a Belize deer, should it replace these ecosystems with um, other services in the form of coastal concrete defences. This would be crippling. And it was estimated that on the basis of that in particular, but also the, the, the fishing and the tourism, that the coral reef and the mangrove were for Belize worth between about a quarter and 40% of its annual GDP, which for a poor, poor country is absolutely immense. So once you start looking at these kinds of studies and you start putting together the evidence, you realise that we're living in really a dream world when it comes to how we look at the environment as something we talk about in terms of economics. We've become used to this utter falsehood being perpetrated now at every level in business and in politics, whereby we have to believe that the price of progress is the destruction of nature. Nothing could be further from the truth. If we wish to have economic development into the future and to be able to support the needs of 9 billion people, which is where we're heading, nature will be our biggest ally. And I think conservationists worldwide need to shout that very loudly, because if we can get that across, then everything else we need to do will become so much easier. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you so much, Tony. That was really inspiring, fascinating. Uh, those stories and many others are, are in his book, so I would urge you to pick up a copy 
at lunchtime.